welcome to Beat 'em Up Wrestling Dark Side of the Ring, the assassination of Dino Bravo. Yeah, this was um, sad. I don't really remember too much of him, um, but just a family testimony about who he was and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah he just left a big mark um, on his you know, community and his fans and um, especially his family. But uh, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I don't know, man. It started off. Like the guy had everything, he was on top of the world, and um, McMahon <laughs> and all his infinite wisdom and glory comes and messes up his life. Yeah, um, so I remember him from re-watching some of the old WrestleManias, and it was the same gimmick that every foreigner always got in WWE. Um, it was just a foreigner that hated America. Um, and I remember him going against Duggan, I remember him going against Ultimate Warrior, and uh, I never knew about his career in Quebec. I didn't know how huge he was out there and how he ran international wrestling. Um, I feel bad for the fact that a life was lost and and he it was because of choices he made. Yeah. Um, international wrestling was the biggest uh, re wrestling organization of the Quebec province. But it just seemed like he was doing everything for himself instead of helping other talent. Get yeah, he up. booked he yeah. booked the bookings around him and his skill set and his storyline. So and it's the same WCW um, story, you know, the, the top guy just writes everything for himself and forgets about the other talent, and then is surprised when the talent leaves for better money to another organization that's gonna not just give him more money but give him more um, better storylines. Yeah, and I mean, it's sad because like when he first comes in, he's teamed up with the, you know, the one and the only Jimmy Hart, you know, and that guy can sell anybody. And yeah. he, of course he did. Everybody started to like him. He became a thing. Um, but we were just talking about it. You know, McMahon did the same thing. Foreigner, you got to make a mockery out of them. You know, mm -hmm. he didn't speak good English, so it was hard for him to cut his promos. He didn't have the, you know, the, the mouth of the South to be there and to do what he does best, which is build up characters. Like he said in, in, in the interviews, you know, you know, he was, he was that package and it was easy to sell somebody like him because he had that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's just the regular Vince McMahon formula. You know, you have um, somebody from a different country, bad English. So then you start basically, they hate America and you play that card. It's always mm -hmm. the same damn card. It hasn't changed to this day. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's crazy because if you look back at the 70s, 80s, and, and 90s, and even now he does this, um, how much xenophobia actually comes from from storylines created in wrestling. I mean, yeah. WWE is not the only one that did this. Uh, other no. organizations did it too, but it seems like even to this day, uh, WWE does that with uh, when Rusa first came up, he hated mm -hmm. America. Um, um, Alberto um, Del Rio hated America. Yeah. Cesaro. Like, yeah, it's just... Wade Barrett. His it, whole character was built around hating America. Yeah, it's just pushing the xenophobia that, that just doesn't really help get the guys over. I mean, it gets them heat, but it's really cheap heat that's not lasting. Um, but then, yeah, like, it just goes back to him booking himself as the strongest guy and then having to come to uh, WWE and then his ego getting in the way because he was used to being the top guy. Yeah. He, he never wanted to learn new wrestling moves. He, he was just Complacent. stuck. Yeah, he was just stuck with his character of who his character was. Yeah, and that's sad because like, as y'all know, I mean, from the history of WWE and what it was, if you're not on top and you're not trying to constantly sell yourself, you fall wayside, you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's exactly what happened. He wasn't adapting to new wrestlers, you know, and then they showed, they were showing like, you know, um, um, Kevin Nash and they were showing like Razor mm -hmm. Ramon and they were showing these guys and the charisma, you know, like you can't even deny the charisma coming off like Razor Ramon and things yeah. like that. Yeah, because 90... And, no, I'm saying he had no, he had no chance. Like, but, he really yeah. didn't. Because in 92 is when he leaves, but in 92 is when we start getting... Um, the ravishing uh, Steve Austin. We have uh, Shawn Michaels already in mm -hmm. there. Um, Bret Hart. We have like you can already see the change of the guard coming. Yeah. And if you for the the ones that refuse to evolve or change, then McMahon didn't see any value in them. And I mean, business wise, you can't blame him for that. Yeah. No. I mean, 
And yeah, yeah, you, I mean, yeah, you might hate the storylines the guy was put into, you know, the stereotypes, yeah. um, but he didn't help himself either, which sucked. And then it rolls into the next part, which is like, he had all this depth, you know what I mean? You live a lifestyle for 20 yeah. something plus years and you have a house and a family and you have this style that you go to and all this money and all, everything. And then you're, what do you do? Yeah. Like you've had no other type of training or education or, you know, any type of, you know, background and any other genre of sports or work field. And he, unfortunately, he was a nice guy and he was a big brute and he became an enforcer. <laughs> Yep. You know, and everybody so, knows that um, nice guys do not finish first. They always finish last. And everybody liked him. And he kind of stepped into situations where he thought maybe his charisma can get him out of it. And I think it basically he was doing too much with yeah. too many people. And I think at, at, towards the end, he kind of knows that the end is coming for him because he yeah. does reach out to people that he hadn't talked to for in a while. He knew he messed um, up. Yeah, it's, is, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's super sad because yeah. his, his lifestyle... He he had accustomed himself to a lifestyle that he wouldn't be able to maintain on a regular job. So he needed to make thousands of dollars. Um, and he wasn't set up to work a nine to five. Mm -mm. Um, so he set himself up for failure. He never gave himself a cushion in case, hey, you know, wrestling is not forever. He never thought about what would come after wrestling. He wrestled for 22 years. And uh, he had family ties to... One of the biggest um, mafias in Quebec, and he was he was at the time mm -hmm. one of the strongest men alive. He was he I mean everybody knew him. His muscles. He, if he walked into the room and and you owed somebody something and he's standing with them, you're either gonna pay up or you're gonna get you're, you're gonna fear you're gonna get hurt. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. So, like I from the documentary, it didn't look like he actually ever hurt somebody. Like I mean, it wasn't really. They like, don't talk about they it. They don't really talk about if it. You're, if seen, you're involved in that, I'm pretty if, sure. I mean, I hope if everybody knows he walks in the room, like you said, he flexes and his t-shirt almost rips. You would probably just do what they want you to do. Um, but, he, but he was known for having a bad temper. So I'm pretty sure, I mean, I can't be positive, but I'm pretty sure he, he did. Yeah. I mean, like the wrestlers, and they didn't really talk too much about that. Um, out of everybody we've seen so far in these things, it looks like he was more of the, in comparison, more of the docile type. Um, his wife never said anything bad about yeah. him. His kid never said anything bad about him. They said his neighbors get, like that. Yeah, he said yeah, he would get mad. He would get pissed real easily, but he would storm out of the locker room. So, you know, he never physically went mm -hmm. at somebody, but um, we don't know exactly how bad he got at the end of everything using, you know, with the mafia ties. But um, it's just going a, back a different to, set of rules there. Yeah, going back so. to like Snuka and things like, you know, Benoit and um, like uh, Lex. With Miss Elizabeth, it's like you, he was the lesser of those people. Um, so like, and he yeah, was, they didn't really talk about him being a um, mm -mm. substance abuser. Or no, anything like that. he was like he honestly, he was a man without a cause. He had no, he had no more mission, and he was so lost. Mm -hmm. And people took advantage of him, and that's what it came down to. He didn't know how to provide for his family, and he just scrambled and just tried to do the best thing he could possibly do. And it sucks because like he also, it's like he shot himself in the foot. You can blame McMahon a little bit, but it's like the two worlds would have never collided, yeah. you know, completely. I mean, he, McMahon messed up some of the biggest names in yeah, wrestling. But but he also, he was he was doing some of the McMahon yeah. stuff in, in international wrestling, too. Instead of uh, helping younger talent so that your company could, could survive, he just kept on making himself... The big dude. The big dude. And it's yeah. like, you He's... can't you can't have an ego when you're trying to run an organization. You can't be the only drawing star because... Yeah. You know, eventually, it, people get tired of it, and they move on to the next big thing. And at that time, WWE was such a show that even the way he set it up, he was never going to be able to compete with it to begin no, with. But it he wasn't was able becoming to, a spectacle. Yeah, at he wasn't going to be able to draw yeah. in new people to his stuff either. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, he had charisma, but it was like no Ultimate Warrior level. Yeah. You know, things like that. Um, you know, Macho Man, Hogan type things, you know. Um, so yeah, I was just sad. I just, it's one of those things where like, I felt for him because he didn't come off as that person. Like we've been seeing in a lot of these. Um, so yeah, I just wish, I mean, his daughter's still so crushed and it's, it's hard. It's hard to see yeah. some of these things because like, it, you know, like they really do a very good job at, um, making them human, making it just more than just wrestling. Um, and that's, that's nice. Like if anybody was not into wrestling, this show would probably give you a different point of view of it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, 
So, yeah, but sad. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, the documentary, there, there there's some people that are interviewed that are kind of shady. That oh, man. I'm just like, um... They're like, oh, they would kill... And, and they, they got for, for for a minute, it was like 50000 he got killed for. And they're like, oh, a lot of people would kill for less. less and then yeah. they interviewed somebody else, he's like, oh, it might have been like half a mil. And they're like, yeah, that can get you killed. It's like, okay, and guys, yeah. look... <laughs> you backstab the mafia or whoever of a person of power, a position of power. It doesn't matter the amounts. You just yeah. basically messed up. And, you know, um, it didn't look like he was running that long with these crews. So I don't think he had a lot to vouch for him or people who were willing to stick up for him either. Um, and then when he passed, there was two other people that were somewhat in, you know, involved in these same things, the, the cigarette trade, um, who also got murdered. Yeah, I think it was just... Too many hands in the cookie jar, and yeah, once you cross one person, that's it. Because he was working with the natives, then he was working with the Italian mafia, and then there was a cocaine uh, kingpin that came involved. Like they lost money. Yeah, it's you're just you're spreading fast. yourself too thin in a world of crime. And if once people don't trust you, or people think that you're crossing them or, or stealing from them, that's it. You're you're a marked man. Yeah, I mean, he definitely didn't do it as, like, an entry-level mafia person. Like, if this was a video game, <laughs> that's to make, like, a light of heart. He didn't just try to make his bills, or, like, he didn't try to make ends meet. He was, like, doing too damn much. Yeah, he tried to grow an empire. Yeah, and it's like, dude, stop it. Like, I understood, like, if, but, I mean, this was his yeah. his repertoire. Like, he built a company around him. Of course he was going to try to build a drug, you know, big, like, business around himself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, I, I didn't know cigarette smuggling was such a big thing back yeah, then. Yeah, I didn't, and it wasn't even that far back. No, <laughs> early nineties. Yeah. I'm well, like, I mean, early nineties now is what twenty, close to thirty years now. But still, you wouldn't think you wouldn't associate smuggling cigarettes. Yeah. It's more of like a 50s, 60s thing in my head. Like when I think about smuggling alcohol. Well, it's because in America we think about uh, moonshining and smuggling yeah, uh, alcohol. It must. It could have been definitely different in their providences yeah. out there. I think there. it was because the cigarette taxes were so high that people would just get. Um, yeah, and it was five dollars out there too. I'm like, man, five dollars is like kind of like normal over here. I'm like, what did they charge them? Twenty five dollars a box or something? Something outrageous. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was the early nineties. I'm curious to look into cigarettes that. were a lot cheaper back then. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, it's a sad story. A family loses um, a, a husband, a father, a son, and. Again, the real victims is the family he left behind. I'm pretty sure they would have been okay with not living in a glorious such a yeah. such a huge with such a huge house and and stuff. Because the things that they say they wish that he would have been here for was the grandchildren. Yeah. Um. And I don't know. Maybe he could have helped somebody else become a a, a wrestling. Maybe he he could have started a wrestling school or really thought about it. But yeah, like I mean, it, it's a lot less money that you're making. But at that time, it's like. You know, your life is worth more. I'm, yeah, it didn't help that one of the main guys in the mafia was related to him, and he was also a wrestler. Yeah. So it's like he felt like camaraderie with mm -hmm. that person. If he would have had somebody that would have been like, hey, let's make a wrestling gym. Let's train people. Like, that positivity. Or even like, I don't know. Like, you know, I don't know. Because the guy was fit. The guy, yeah, the guy I mean... was huge. You know, he could have definitely, he would have sold that. He could have definitely just gotten students like like that. Yeah. You know, but um, yeah, it's just a tragedy. It's another good one, guys. Definitely watch it if you get a chance. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. We're still gonna go back. And yeah, we're, we've been talking about the Montreal screw job. Yeah, we will finally see it. Um, it just got a little hectic with dynamite and everything else. But uh, yeah, we will see you guys next time. Peace.